So today we will be having Dr. Kevin McQueen. There's Kevin. Um, he will be uh, presenting a lecture on his new book, um, A City Without Care. Uh, his research is important, timely, and um, very, uh, very illuminating. Um, um, I myself am Amanda Thales. I'm an archivist at the City Archives, and um, I'm grateful to Kevin for reaching out and giving us this presentation today. And now I'm going to turn this to look at Kevin, and you will see his presentation on the screen. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much, Amanda, for um, hosting this event, facilitating this. Thank everyone for attending in person uh, and via Zoom. I really appreciate it. Um, and I'm really excited to do this talk with the library. A lot of my research I did through the City Archives, um, and it's a really great resource. So I'm particularly excited to be able to make this presentation here through this space. Um, I also live in this neighborhood, so it's really nice to be able to use the same library that you know I am is a resource for my community. So. Um, okay, so today I'm going to be talking about my book. I'm going to read the title because I never remember what the full title is. Um, it's City Without Care, 300 Years of Racism, Health Disparities, and Healthcare Activism in New Orleans. Um, and it just came out in May. Um, and so it, it, it came out through UNC Press. So if you are interested in, in purchasing at some point, it is available through them and through online um, book retailers too. Um, this book looks at what I call the racialization of healthcare. This is going to be my like jargony, like, one slide, so we'll, we'll get through it, um, and I promise it'll get more interesting after this. But I wanted to define what I mean by this term racialized healthcare. So my book takes a look at the healthcare system that exists in New Orleans from the city's founding in 1718 through the present and addresses several research questions. Um, first off, what led to the development and perpetuation of this healthcare system, especially this system that has created health disparities? What are the connections between racialized healthcare and a larger system of racist hierarchy? How has a racialized healthcare system impacted the health of Black residents? And how have African Americans fought against this system? Um, so, this work defines a racialized healthcare system as one built on um, different levels of access to and treatment for whites versus non whites based on the placement of individuals into racial categories and often on ideas of scientific racism that define African-Americans historically as biologically different from and inferior to whites. The embedding of racism into the structure of healthcare seen most visibly in historically white healthcare institutions. So would be hospitals, healthcare clinics, medical schools that have carried out efforts of exclusion of African-Americans as patients and practitioners. The exploitation of African-Americans by white medical practitioners for profit and professional advancement the perpetuation of racial health disparities and support for the larger system of racist hierarchy with whites at the top. Um, this framework draws very heavily upon critical race theory. You may have heard a thing or two about critical race theory in the past couple of years. Um, and in particular, this work draws on some work by um, Eduardo Benio Silva, who made a, 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 has done a lot of really great research on what he defines as historically white um, institutions in higher education. So I, I borrow some of the language that he uses. And um, you may be familiar with the term historically black colleges and universities, HBCUs. Um, he's made this argument that actually we should really refer to institutions that have historically been for whites as historically white institutions. Most colleges and universities in the United States have historically been for whites. And so I, I kind of borrow similar language and talk about historically white medical institutions, hospitals and clinics, and medical schools. Um, here's the kind of argument part of this. Um, I argue that racialized healthcare emerges as this key component of the slave-based economy in New Orleans. It becomes institutionalized with the end of Reconstruction, the rise of Jim Crow. This system helps make segregation, and unfortunately, it still exists today. This system has historically served white interests in ways that have financially benefited members of the medical community, which I'll talk a little bit about. And it is both accommodated and supported a racist economic system and a hierarchy which survives from slavery to Jim Crow to the post-World War II era and into the post-Katrina era. Government policies at the local, state, and federal level have helped the system grow and sustain. 
And within these systems, African-Americans have fought for access to healthcare and for improved health, including carving out their own healthcare system, um, but have always had to face limitations imposed by the racist hierarchy. So I mentioned that one of the things that this system does is it, it produces profits for its owners, for the medical practitioners. Uh, in the period of slavery, we have um, a system of what are known as slave hospitals. Um, you can see one of the pictures of this up here on the screen on the top left, um, maybe the top right for people in the Zoom, but this is Toro. Um, and for those of you not too familiar with this institution, right, this is institution is being created uh, in the mid uh, 19th century in New Orleans. And this is an example of a, a slave hospital. And you can see this here, the language here uh, under the picture, terms from one to $5 per day, slaves $1 per day. Um, Toro is an example of a number of medical clinics that spring up in the early to mid 19th century that derive a lot of profit off of the treatment of enslaved people. The healthcare is paid for by enslavers and they're not doing so out of benevolence, they're doing so out of in increased profit. When enslaved people get sick, they make this calculus. Can I restore them to health? What is the amount of money that I'm willing to spend on this person based on the amount of money that I've used to purchase this person? And therefore they will treat them either with some type of doctor on the plantation, or they might bring them to an institution like Toro. Um, Toro derives a great deal of its wealth from this. Institutions like Toro are not able to survive unless they are able to get healthcare provided by enslavers. Um, about half their patients in this time period leading up to the Civil War are enslaved people. And as you can see, they're actually treated on separate spaces. Typically, the way that this space would work is you'd have one floor for whites who are going to be treated in a larger room if you're paying a lower rate. And then you have another floor for higher income whites who are going to be paying for a private room. And then a third floor, the top floor, typically for enslaved patients, and they're going to be kept segregated from the white patients below. Um, that profit from that system allows this system to survive, to grow. And it allows those medical practitioners to not only get money, but to be able to earn a lot of prestige going forward. Right? So that is a, a kind of key part of this. This is one of the, the key moments, the key crucial turning points that I'll just talk about a little bit today. So I'm, I'm gonna focus on some, some key turning points when I argued that there was this moment to break the racialized healthcare system. And it continues. And I'll talk about just briefly the 1860s, 1870s, the early 20th century, and then the 1960s, 1970s as well, the civil rights era, why this happens and why this system is allowed to continue. So in this moment in the 1860s, 1870s, we have the spread of slavery. New Orleans has become the hub of the slave trade, the domestic slave trade in the United States. Tens of thousands of individuals are being brought from the upper South, sold here in New Orleans to plantations and to enslavers in this area and in the greater Mississippi River Valley. Um, and they need healthcare provided for by these systems. And so doctors and clinics are gonna proliferate and derive a lot of wealth and prestige from these institutions. Um, the also going to garner a, a lot of, of, of prestige as well. Um, and you can see here, this is um, uh, something taken from the city archives. So this is the record of admission for Toro. And if you can see it here on the column on the right, it lists the occupation. And so you can see here, uh, individuals identified as slave that is listed as their occupation. Um, and so, like I said, about 50% of their income that they're deriving the 1850s going into the early 1860s is from enslavers paying for the healthcare by enslaved people. Um, similarly, doctors are also going to uh, amass prestige as well from the publication of medical research that's being done on the lives of enslaved patients. Um, doctors in this community in New Orleans are going to be carrying out medical experiments on enslaved patients uh, at places like Charity Hospital. They are going to do, for example, the first attempted blood transfusion in the United States. It takes place here um, in New Orleans at Charity Hospital by a white doctor on an enslaved patient, and the enslaved patient dies. The white doctor had only seen it done once in Paris, attempted it here, didn't really know what he's doing, patient died. Um, and it is a reflection of the 
evaluation of black life that, that he thinks that he can do this and there's not going to be any type of consequences for this and there's not. White doctors look at enslaved patients as people that they can experiment on. Um, there are experiments carried out on removal of cataracts. One of the early advances, one of the early doctors in the um, history of studying cataracts and disease of the eye is a physician here, and he's doing experiments on enslaved people. Treatments for smallpox and typhoid. Um, treatments, advancements in the field of um, obstetrics and gynecology. Many of this is done here in New Orleans. Very famously, there's an individual, J. Marion Sims, who's operating out of Alabama. But some of the early um, uh, advances that are being carried out and early experiments that are being carried out in the field of gynecology are being carried out here in New Orleans uh, by some pretty prominent physicians here. Right? Similarly, these spaces that are medical schools, Right. Schools like um, uh, Tulane, which gets started in the 1830s, uh, this is a school that is founded by physicians here that want to make a profit. They charge admission, they charge student fees, and so this is the way that they can make a profit. And they're going to be teaching about medicine. They also are going to have a practice where they are allowed to have their students learn in Charity Hospital. It's one of the first medical schools in the United States that allows patients or practitioners, medical students, to have access to patients in a hospital. And many of these are going to be enslaved patients. Similarly, they have their own museum where they are going to collect specimens and bones and cadavers that are donated by other doctors in the area, many of them are going to be enslaved patients. Um, this is an institution, this museum had operated through the late 20th century. And I, I believe the space still is in existence, although it's not open to the public currently, um, from what I am aware. But this is something that is created, achieves pretty great fame for the people who create this space. And this is how medical students are learning about medicine. They are being taught notions of scientific racism, notions that African Americans are biologically different from or inferior to whites, which is not accurate at all. But this is being instilled into those medical students from those doctors who are carrying out these medical experiments. There is a moment in time when there is this opportunity to kind of break away from the system with the ending of slavery. And another way I'll, I'll just briefly point this out to you, you can see some of the connections between slavery and the medical institutions. Um, these are some of the, the um, hospital records for charity um, from the Louisiana State Museum. Um, charity and several of the other hospitals here enslave people. Um, they themselves are enslavers. They have enslaved people working in the kitchens, working as nurses. In fact, some of my research seems to indicate that the, maybe the first Black surgeon in the United States in the late 18th century is an enslaved man at Charity Hospital owned by the Spanish owner of Charity Hospital. And he's forced to be a doctor there and carrying out you know, procedures there. Um, so these institutions are not only supporting slavery through scientific racism, through the treatment of enslaved people and the treatment of enslavers, they themselves are buying and selling enslaved lives going forward. There is a moment in time when there is this opportunity to disrupt this system. We have the capture of New Orleans in the Civil War. Right? New Orleans falls very early, and we have this occupation by the federal government. There is this moment to potentially end this healthcare system. Here, during this Reconstruction period, there is this attempt to allow African Americans to have some access to health care. Um, with the ending of slavery, tens of thousands of formerly enslaved people come to New Orleans seeking freedom. And they do gain some access to health care in the form primarily of this institution here. This is the Marine Hospital in Algiers, this picture here in 1864. This became the Freedmen's Hospital. So the Corps d'Afrique which was the precursor to the United States colored troops had their own hospital here in New Orleans. They took over the Marine Hospital in Algiers in 1864, and they operated this as the Freedmen's Hospital. This was a space that was originally open to United States colored troops, um, uh, members of the African-Americans who were serving in the Civil War, they're allowed to use this space. And then it opens up to African-American civilians. 
Um, and this space will treat thousands of formerly enslaved people from this period, 1865 through 1869. It's part of a series of hospitals operated throughout the United States by the Freedmen's Bureau. Similarly, Charity Hospital officially desegregates. They are taken over. They are told that they have to get rid of their discriminatory policies, and they have to desegregate, which they do so from 1868 through 1877. Here is this moment in time when that healthcare system of racism should have ended. The federal government kind of could have pushed this. We should have had all healthcare institutions open, including the medical schools. But sadly, this does not happen. Charity and the Freedmen's Hospital are really the only spaces that treat Black patients. The white hospitals that previously operated and excluded African Americans continue to do so. Right? Some of them will treat a few number, a limited number of African American patients, but then will stop doing so even before the ending of Reconstruction. And so here is this moment in time when the system could have been broken, and it continues. Instead, in 1877, the Redeemers, the Southern Democrats, regain power, and we lose this opportunity. The healthcare institutions that desegregated, resegregate, Charity Hospital does so even in violation of the um, state constitution. Tulane, uh, this medical school, refuses to admit black, patient, or black students, and this system of racialized healthcare continues. All right, and so just kind of briefly here, here's the 1868 Constitution. This is a document that includes into this, this right to public spaces, this right of public rights, including the access to hospitals, which should have been enforced and has not done so. And again, the right to public education. Medical schools like Tulane should have desegregated. They do not do so in violation of the state constitution, which is basically just ignored. We have the violence that is carried out here in places and events like this is the Battle of Liberty Place, this attempt in 1874 to overthrow the democratically elected government here. Many of the leaders of the Battle of Liberty Place are doctors. The person who gives the speech rallying people to come to go home, grab your guns, and come back and overthrow the government is a doctor. Many of the prominent members of this white league are physicians. They are proponents of white supremacy in addition to being proponents of scientific racism. A second crucial turning point is in the 1910s and 1920s when New Orleans invests millions of dollars in improvements, including water, sewage, and drainage. They carried out public health campaigns against diseases like tuberculosis. We experienced dramatic growth in medical institutions with significant federal funding from sources like the WPA. This is one of the, uh, the great pictures that I found in the city archives, the building of Charity Hospital, which is funded by federal money. Okay. This is from the city planning um, uh, uh, collection. And so this is something that um, Amanda had been talking about before. So New Orleans in the 1920s has one of the city, uh, the United States first city plans. And they do so and they start to expand access to resources like water and sewage and drainage in areas that were previously not getting so. They're doing so because they want to improve their image. They want to bolster the growing tourism trade and then also the trade in goods like fruit with Latin America. And it's hard for them to do so when the city has such a high mortality rate. So they decide we need to tackle issues like tuberculosis. So they do municipal and public health and health improvements which have significant improvements for white residents and should have improved black access to healthcare and health. And again, this, this does not happen. The white institutions that are created don't open. We have a tuberculosis hospital that opens up here. It is not open up to African-Americans, right? They'll be treated in separate segregated spaces. The improvements that are done in the city that happen when we expand water and sewage and drainage, we couple it with um, a racial segregation ordinance, which is technically illegal on its face. They'd been struck down by the Supreme Court as unconstitutional in, the, in 1918. New Orleans enacts its own residential segregation ordinance in the 1920s. And as city improvements are done, as they expand water and sewage and drainage and sidewalks to areas that previously had not had it, improve those neighborhoods, white residents will come in, they will use the police to kick out African-Americans out of those neighborhoods. So here's what's going on same time, right? Health improvements are being made, African-Americans are not getting access to this. As municipal improvements are being made to improve white health, 
African Americans are not gaining the same type of access to this, and this system is continuing. And finally, we have probably the greatest opportunity to dismantle this system, the period of civil rights. Right? Jim Crow is a system of segregation that is based upon, in a lot of ways, racialized healthcare. They create a system that argues that we need to segregate African Americans from whites. They do so partially by justifying it and saying, well, African Americans have higher rates of disease. And if we have African Americans in the same schools as whites are going to spread disease, even though the reason that they have higher rates of disease and mortality is because they have a segregated healthcare system. So it's a self-perpetuating loop, right? Let's not allow them access to spaces, white spaces or hospitals or municipal improvements We'll create this racialized health disparity, and then we'll use this as the justification for the segregation, which we already created. Okay. The civil rights era presents this opportunity to dismantle this system. In the 1960s, we have some pretty key victories, including things here. Right? In 1963, we have a lawsuit initiated by the NAACP, which strikes down what is known as the Hill-Burton Act. This was a 1948 federal law that gave money to hospitals to either build new hospitals or expand their existing hospitals. Um, because the United States, there's a study that says we don't have enough hospital beds after World War II. So we significantly expand the number of hospitals and hospital beds in the United States. But they allow whites only hospitals to take federal money or segregated spaces to take money. And it is really the only time that you're going to see a federal bill legally in code separate but equal into one of these, these policies. And they do so, and they allow these whites only spaces to build. This is challenged by the NAACP and it's struck down in the Simpkins versus Cohn case in 1963. We have the passage of the Civil Rights Act in 1964, which include a provision that says that it is now illegal to discriminate in hospitals. Finally, we have Medicare and Medicaid in 1965, which stipulate that healthcare institutions must not discriminate or they would lose federal funding, including Medicare and Medicaid, which are great infusions of cash into the healthcare system. We also have a series of subsequent lawsuits that mandate the integration of hospitals and medical schools here in New Orleans and throughout the country. Right? Um, I pictured here, this is the march on City Hall that is being carried out. This is a march that takes place here in New Orleans, 10,000 people march from Shakespeare Park in Central City to City Hall and demand integration. Um, one of the things that they originally included as part of the revisions, which they were going to give to the city, was an integration of charity and healthcare institutions. Um, and ultimately, they, they dropped this provision in favor of access to jobs and to voting rights. But this is something that they are focused on. And the NAACP here, the chapter here does initiate a number of lawsuits against hospitals and medical schools that are discriminating. All these things should have led to the end of racialized healthcare. However, this system is allowed to continue. Right? Prior to the late 1960s, white New Orleanians who made up about 60% of the population had more than a dozen hospitals that they could use, including Southern Baptist, pictured here. We have Hotel Du, Ashner Hospital, most of these institutions are going to be located in what has become the medical district of New Orleans, um, which is pretty close to the downtown area here, central business district here. Right? Most whites have access to a number of hospitals throughout this area. Right? African Americans, on the other hand, have access primarily to two institutions. So even though they're 40% of the population, they get access to two hospitals. One of the hospitals is this building here. Um, this is Flint Goodridge Hospital. And for those of you not familiar with this, this is an institution which gets started in 1896. It's opened up by a chapter of the Phyllis Wheatley Club. They decide that they wanna open up their own hospital and they enter into a partnership with New Orleans University. Um, not, not to be confused with UNO, New Orleans University is, um, um, is a HBCU. We have a series of African-American colleges, universities that are started here, Strait University, New Orleans University. Um, New Orleans University opens up its own medical school in the 1880s. There are several attempts to create black medical schools here in the 1870s and 1880s. The state unconstitutionally denies funding to them. Finally, we get the opening up of a black medical school with New Orleans University. 
and the Phyllis Wheatley Club starts their own hospital here in the Flint Goodridge Hospital. The um, medical school, which becomes Flint Medical School, takes over that space, which later on becomes Flint Goodridge Hospital, starting in 1897. This institution, they're going to partner together and produce a number of graduates of this Black medical school. Over the course of about 20 years, they will produce 116 African-American physicians that will not just be doctors here, but throughout the state and throughout the Gulf South, pretty prominent physicians. Um, that institution, Flint Medical School, which I'll go back to the previous slide, was originally located here in the medical district, was located pretty close to um, Charity Hospital. Um, it is basically chased out of the medical district. There are attempts to expand the space because the hospital and the medical school aren't, aren't, aren't big enough. They try to purchase land. The city refuses to give, allow them to get land. The white landowners do not want them to purchase land. And so instead, they're going to move here to Central City. Um, by the time period that this does so in the 1930s, Central City has become one of the largest hubs of African Americans in the city. Part of the reason this happens is because this is the part of the city that at this time period has the lowest levels of access to municipal improvements, water, sewage, drainage. So it's the area that is deemed as the least desirable. So the city makes a concentrated effort to try to put African Americans in that space. The city's first school, the city's first playground the city's first um, pool that has opened to African-Americans are gonna all be located here, all within blocks of Flint Goodridge. When Flint Goodridge wants to expand, they're looking for an area, the city will only really allow them to buy land in Central City, which they do so. And so they're trying to concentrate African-Americans into this space. And we have the opening of this. Here's the dedication of Flint Goodridge Hospital here in 1931. The space is administered by Dillard. Dillard is formed in the 1920s by emerging of New Orleans and Strait University, and they take over the administration of this hospital uh, under Albert Dent, who is the city, uh, the hospital's first black administrator. This is going to be a really remarkable space in not just the history of this city, but really in the history of, of healthcare in the United States. This will be a city, uh, a hospital institution, which is going to expand significantly and have three decades of really just unprecedented success. They will carry out public health initiatives, focusing on tuberculosis, infant and maternal health. They'll make neighborhood clinics. They will start a postgraduate education program, the first of its kind really open to African-Americans in this region. And black physicians from throughout the United States will come here because they don't have access to postgraduate programs and other hospitals throughout the United States. They will start a hospital insurance program, one of the first such programs in the United States called the penny a day program, where you would pay $3.65 a year and you would have access to a hospital for um, up to several weeks. And they achieved remarkable success at this space. In 1930, when this new hospital is dedicated, the black mortality rate is 25.5 per 1,000 black residents. Right? The white mortality rate is 11.3 per 1,000. So it's more than double the black rates. By 1970, because the efforts of Flint Goodrich Hospital and other black physicians and healthcare practitioners throughout the city, that death rate has declined dramatically. The black death rate at that time period is 10.06 per 1,000 compared to 9.15 per 1,000 for whites. So in three decades, because of this effort of this institution and other black medical practitioners, they have virtually closed this mortality gap, which is just absolutely significant victory here. In addition, African-Americans ha also have access to this space, to Charity Hospital. Right? Charity is a space that opens up here in New Orleans right after the founding of this, uh, the city. It is the second oldest at the time period, the second oldest continually operating hospital in the United States. It is a space for African-Americans that they can use, but do so only in a segregated space. So. Charity Hospital will allow African-Americans if you are of a low income or indigent income status, but they will only treat them in a segregated space that is underfounded and overcrowded. Um, here is a picture of the African-American ward in Charity Hospital in 1927. I know it's a little grainy here, but as you can see here, all the patients are sleeping too early, um, which is a very bad thing to do in a hospital, right? 
because here's a great way to have the spread of disease. They'll also take people with communicable diseases like tuberculosis and put them in the same spaces with people who have a broken leg. Right? When the um, American Medical Association, they come down and they document this and take pictures of this, and they're appalled at the conditions from this. And it's not like the American Medical Association is known as the most progressive organization, and even they think this is really appalling here. Um, you can see here is African-American patients waiting to enter the, um, the Black Ward and Charity Hospital. So one thing that Charity Hospital does is it creates separate Black spaces. They also have a separate, black, uh, a separate back entrance for African-Americans to use. African-Americans have to use go around the back to literally enter this. And there is even segregated spaces in the waiting rooms. Um, there are a number of um, chairs that are for white residents. And even though African-Americans uh, can, should be able to sit in those seats, even if they're open for white residents, they're not allowed to sit in those spaces. So it is a completely segregated space, but it is a space where some African-Americans gain, can gain some access to healthcare. This is the institution that is probably going to experience the greatest efforts at integration. The same month that LBJ signs the Civil Rights Act of 1964 into law, Callie Castle, who is the grandmother of civil rights leader, Aretha Castle Haley becomes the lead plaintiff in a lawsuit that will lead to the desegregation of Charity Hospital. In the following years, Charity is going to really witness a dramatic increase in the number of Black patients from under 50% prior to integration to 77% of Charity's patients by July 1965. Three, year, three months after the directors announced that they had ended the segregated wars, and nearly a year after the Civil Rights Act of 1964 forbid the practice. However, official integration does not lead to the end of discrimination. Many of the hospital will defy court orders and federal mandates to end discrimination, leading to years of confrontation between black patients and white employees and administrators at this space. This includes delays in treatments with white patients given priority over black patients, abuse, sexual assault, discrimination in hiring and promotion and treatment, separate areas still in waiting rooms for black patients, even separate benches, water fountains, and telephones since the late 1960s, 1970s. Black residents, particularly women, will lead this fight against this treatment, including the resident initiated Committee for Black Health and the local NWCP chapter, which will file continued complaints and lawsuits against Charity Hospital. The historically white private hospitals to divide integration, illegally refusing to serve Black Medicaid patients. They would primarily send their Black patients to Charity Hospital, which is illegal. And they would hire few or no Black doctors and discriminate against the number of limited number of Black employees that they had. Although the NAACP brought complaints to the federal government, to the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, the federal agency does little in the late 1960s. In 1970, a group of Black women, aided by the NAACP, initiates a nationally significant lawsuit. This group, with Rosella Cook as the lead plaintiff, sues 10 New Orleans hospitals and the New Orleans State Department of Hospitals for violation of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, the Hilburton Act, the Medicare and Medicaid Acts. They also sue Q, the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare, for failure to enforce the federal laws. This resulting court case, Cook versus Oshner, will linger in the courts for the next two decades. In 1974, after years of pressure from the NAACP, as well as increasing attention due to the Cook case, Q conducts a three-year study of New Orleans that documents that the system is virtually the same in the late 1970s as it was prior to integration. They find that 75% of all Black patients in New Orleans use either Flint Goodridge or Charity Hospital. And despite the fact that African Americans comprise more than 55% of the city's population, the other hospitals admit few or no Black patients and few or no Medicaid and Medicaid patients. Many of the Black patients that do end up in these historically white institutions are individuals of higher income. Discrimination in employment continues as well with few or no Black doctors in these private hospitals. Discrimination continues to the hospital, other hospitals' positions as well, with the racial sorting of African Americans into low wage jobs and repeated complaints to the NAACP. Hugh finds that nearly every single private hospital in this area is out of compliance with the federal laws. 
they charged seven hospitals in 1977 and 1978 with violating the Civil Rights Act and the Hilburton Act. One hospital settles, but the others remain defiant. Q begins formal procedures against three. And the way that Q can operate is if they find that you are discriminating, they can cut off all federal funding to you. Right? And this is kind of the ultimate punishment for a hospital. So they decide to target three hospitals, to use them as example cases. They target Hotel Dieu, Mercy Hospital, and Southern Baptist. After the hospitals refuse to follow through on a list of actions that Hugh mandates, the agency begins formal termination proceedings of federal funding in 1978. However, federal law stipulates that a judge review this case. And when he does so in 1979, he strikes down many of the requirements. Instead, he simply tells the hospitals to remind their employers that the employees, you cannot discriminate. He encourages them to hire black employees. And with that, he dismisses the federal termination of, of, of funding. Okay. So here's the federal government with this opportunity to do so, and they largely abandon their effort to you know, really eliminate this system. The Cook case does lead to some policy changes. Hugh now quantifies the amount of free care previously not specified that any hospital that received Hill Burton funding has to perform at 3% minimum for 20 years after receiving federal funding. So if you get Hill Burton money from the federal government, you have to give at least 3% of your care to low income or no income patients. In 1979, most of the hospitals involved in the initial Cook lawsuit settle with the families of the people that they discriminated against. They also start to provide additional Medicare and Medicaid funding. So they say, we will treat more Medicare and Medicaid patients. But instead of taking it and providing more beds for Medicare and Medicaid patients at their hospitals, they send it to charity and say, charity, you should treat all the Medicare and Medicaid patients. We don't want them. So they allow charity to get more nurses and more beds. Some hospitals will continue their appeals. It's not until 1989 that West Jefferson General Hospital and East Jefferson General Hospital signed consent degrees to recruit Black physicians and give Medicaid patients full access to the hospitals. Right? And these are big institutions in this community, so much so that post-Katrina, they become the, the, the open public hospitals here. Despite these settlements, Hugh's failure to really do anything or deal out real punishment allows racialized healthcare to continue. As a result, white doctors at historically white Hospitals continue to send most low-income, Black, Medicaid, and Medicare patients to either Charity or Flint Goodrich. At Charity, two notable things happen as African-Americans successfully fight for integration. First thing, white patients leave. They leave Charity and start going to those historically white hospitals in the city and new white flight hospitals in the suburbs. Um, this includes the Methodist Hospital. Methodist Hospital opens in 1968, and here's a memorandum um, from the Methodist Hospital. Um, they noted, and this is the memorandum that they sent out to the mayor, to the city council, to their Orleans Parish Medical Society, and to community business leaders. And in it, they note that they have decided to locate their hospital in the proposed site, which is in the northern section of New Orleans East, so that it would serve a majority white population and that the black population, which was mostly in the southern section of New Orleans East of the time period, would be, quote, outside of the expected service area. This is 1968. This is four years after the Civil Rights Act. And here's this institution saying, we're building this hospital here so it can serve white people. We don't want to serve black patients. And they get money and approval from the city. Right? This is a, a white flight hospital within this, within basically New Orleans. And then there are other white flight hospitals that pop up in the suburbs of New Orleans as well. And patients will leave the city. They will leave not just the schools and the parks. They will also leave the hospitals here and take their services out of the city. So same thing, right, is happening with Charity Hospital. As the white patients are leaving, the state decides to cut a state funding for this. So this is a state-funded hospital. So as white patients leave, the state starts to decrease funding for charity hospital, leading to nursing and physician cuts, declines in the number of beds, decrease in quality of care, repeated episodes of loss of accreditation, and the near closure of it for the next several decades. Fortunately, activists are able to keep this space open, but the state is cutting funding for this space. Flint Goodridge suffers through the same issues, financial problems. Although hospital administrators hope that integration will actually help the hospital, 
that white patients will come to use this space, this does not happen. And so here's one of the ironies is the historically white medical institutions, they turn away black patients and they don't want to integrate. Flint Goodridge does, and white patients refuse to go to this space. When the hospital enacts a new policy in 1966 that forbids visiting physicians who are the vast majority of doctors at the space, because when that black medical school closes here um, in the 19-teens, um, Flint Medical College is forced to close because of a, a, a report by the American Medical Association known as the Flexner Report that basically forces the closure of every single black medical school except for two in the United States, Meharry in Nashville and Howard in Washington, DC. It really closes this pipeline of black physicians here. So by the World War II, there's this mass loss of physicians that either die out or they leave because of Jim Crow discriminatory policies. So there's only 30 or 40 black physicians in the entire city. Most of them are working at Flint Goodrich, but there's not enough to, to operate this space. So instead, Flint Goodrich primarily uses visiting white physicians who will treat their patients at Flint Goodrich Hospital, their black patients there. They institute a new policy in 1966 that says that you cannot just treat your white patients at the historically white hospitals and then your black patients at Flint Goodrich. You can't do this. Um, and if you do so, you're going to lose your admitting privileges. Um, in the next several years, every single phys white physician except for one is going to quit Flint Goodrich Hospital because they don't want to do this. They don't want to bring their white patients there. They want to bring their upper income black patients to private hospitals, and they do so. And it really financially damages the institution. The other thing that's happening into this time period is we have the creation of what's known as HEAL. Um, in 1968, the state legislature creates the Health Education Authority of Louisiana. This is a bill that authorizes the creation of a board of directors comprised of business leaders, lawyers, heads of insurance companies, members of the Chamber of Commerce, and representatives from several historically white medical institutions, including Tulane and LSU Medical School. HEAL can initiate voter approved bonds for these eligible health institutions, hospitals, and medical schools to buy property and build new structures and parking lots, use eminent domain to acquire lots that refuse to sell to them, and then offer expertise on how to expand. HEAL seeks to build training centers and housing for medical professionals and students that this new medical district is going to get as it expands. HEAL applies for a federal funding for a proposed 289 acre area with 30 acres for a new medical complex and the rest redeveloped for housing and other facilities. And you can see here, here's a proposed site of HEAL. Here is, you can see here the proposed dome stadium. So this is the Superdome here. So this is the medical district. This is the site today of the medical district, the um, UMCNO. This is gonna be operating a lot of that. Um, really occupying a lot of that same space. This is a proposal that's being done in the late 1960s. So they're applying for funding for a 289 acre area and they're gonna get 30 acres for a new medical complex. The rest is gonna be redeveloped for housing and other facilities. Leaders plan to close Charity Hospital, replace it with two new university hospitals, one for Tulane and one for LSU. Heal reflects the continuing power of racialized healthcare. There's no African-Americans on the appointed board of directors. The potential beneficiaries of HEAL are all historically white healthcare institutions, all of which have been facing repeated lawsuits and investigations for racial discrimination. The plan also represents a con continuity of displacement by historically white medical institutions. I'll go back to one of my previous slides. Um, when Charity Hospital is built here, and you can see this here in the 1930s, that space, space around um, Charity Hospital, much of it is occupied by Black residents and Black businesses. Federal government gives WPA money to build Charity Hospital. They also give WPA money to do what they call um, uh, clearance of slum housing. So they displace hundreds of Black residents and businesses and churches and kick them out of this area to build Charity Hospital, the new complex in the 1930s. They decide to do so the same type of thing here when they're expanding Heal in the 1960s. So they plan to displace an additional 250 black families and businesses in this adjacent area for this new medical complex. 
Black residents organize. They form a group to oppose these efforts. Over the group's protest, the city approves an application for federal urban renewal funding in 1971. However, by the time period that the application gets to the federal government, the Nixon administration has largely gutted urban renewal and other great society programs, and the funding is never approved. In some ways, this is a victory. That group, because they fight against this, it delays the city's approval, it delays their application for this. And here's this really significant victory. So they're able to keep those Black residents and businesses into these area. But racialized healthcare continues. And this plan is going to, I'll get back to this in a few minutes, but this plan is obviously going to continue into the future. Right? Although this plan fails in 1972, he successfully passes a $37.5 million tax-exempt bond for Tulane to build their own hospital in 1975. That hospital is serving a predominantly middle and upper income and mostly white clientele. In fact, when the hospital board leaders meet with hospital corporations to propose a joint partnership, Tulane's leaders tell the business representatives that the, the hospital is a good investment as it would, quote, keep low income patients at a minimum by sending any such patients to nearby charity, which they also operate. So they want their hospital to basically be a space for upper or middle income patients, and they're going to send their patients to charity. This is a practice known in the medical community as dumping. It's later declared illegal in the 1980s by Congress. But here's kind of a conflict of interest. They have their own hospital. They're also administrating charity, and they want to make money off of this space. In the following decades, there's a, a couple things that, uh, that, that happen. Um, with racialized healthcare system per being perpetuated, declining and funding a charity hospital, you're going to have a closure of city-run clinics as well. So in the 1960s, there are efforts by Black residents, especially at some of the city's um, housing units, to pressure the city to build new clinics here. Right? Um, and so they are going to push for the creation of some new clinics. Some that are going to be operated by the health department in the late 1960s. They get them put up throughout the city, especially in the public housing units. Um, the city, though, cuts its funding and they close these clinics over the objection of residents. You're going to have a, a second effort to create federally funded clinics through the Model Cities Clinic Program. Um, this is a program that's funded by the federal government. It opens up in the late 1960s and early 1970s. And they open up a series of clinics here in New Orleans in some of the public housing units. These are remarkable spaces that will serve, over the first several years, three years, they serve 130,000 patients. And I want to note them in particular because in addition to treating acute health problems, they're also going to be focusing on trying to address chronic health problems, eye problems, diabetes, Right? They're trying to focus on preventative health. And for many patients, this is their first access to any type of primary health care, preventative health care, chronic health care problems. Unfortunately, again, the Nixon administration guts this program and they close them in 1973. And then finally, we have perhaps the, the shortest and most dramatically ended clinic with the Black Panther Party. Um, the Black Panther Party is founded in Oakland in the late 1960s as one of their main missions for the Black Panther Party. They also try to create clinics, clinics that are going to be operated by community members and activists that are going to be focusing on providing health care for African-Americans and addressing some chronic health problems and problems that have been ignored by the white medical community, including sickle cell anemia. There is a chapter that opens up here in New Orleans. Um, the, they operate their own clinic. They first build a clinic at the St. Thomas Housing Units in May of 1970. Then the landlord, who is a white district uh, judge, orders its eviction after weeks of occupancy. They move to Desire neighborhood in 1970. This clinic offers basic medical treatment, booster shots for children, sickle cell anemia screening, in addition to a free breakfast program for children and neighborhood cleanups. However, many white residents and many white leaders view the Black Panther Party as threatening, as militant and subversive. Three weeks after they move into Desire, the police successfully pressure the landlord to evict the group again. And then they raid the house in September of 1970. And for those of you who may be familiar with the showdown at Desire, 
Um, this is the part of this raid. So in, in September 1970, over 100 local and state officers lobbed tear gas and fire over 30,000 rounds of ammunition in 30 minutes at the Black Panther Party members who had barricaded themselves inside this house. Somehow no one is injured and police arrest 13 members of Black Panther Party. Other members open up a new headquarters in a nearby um, apartment. Three weeks later, police and tanks arrive to evict the members, which leads to a confrontation between residents of Desire and the police, resulting in the burning down of this building uh, and the wounding of a number of residents. These are efforts to try to create health care at a, a, a really a grassroots effort initiated by residents to try to address many of the healthcare problems that are taking place that the healthcare institutions themselves are ignoring. And they really end you know, pretty, pretty poorly because of these efforts to try to, to maintain the system of white supremacy. In the following two decades, conditions at the two black majority serving hospitals declined with shrinking funding. By 1981, 70% of patients at Flint Goodridge are on either Medicare or Medicaid which the federal government continually underfunds. Here's one of the major problems. Medicare and Medicaid are you know, really fantastic programs, especially in theory. One of the problems of it has been that the federal government has continually underfunded this program. So hospitals that provide care for Medicare and Medicaid patients, you a lot of times historically have had to apply for reimbursement from the federal government. Oftentimes, the federal government will either delay this payment or they will not give you enough payment. So meaning the, the cost of what is actually provided to you is not actually covered by the federal Medicare and Medicaid patients, um, uh, patient uh, coverage. So hospitals that are doing so are losing money. And since Flint Goodridge is carrying out most of these procedures, they're hemorrhaging money for the next decade. They estimate by the 1980s that the federal government owes them $600,000 for unpaid or partially paid claims. The hospital is also hurt by the city's refusal to sell them adjacent property. Um, even though they're selling it to spaces like Tulane, they refuse to sell them adjacent property. The state refuses to allow them to support their efforts for new federal funding. Local banks refuse to give them federal loan or needed loans. In 1982, Dillard, which had been operating Flint Goodridge for decades, after years of losses, decide to sell. Twice they reached deals with a group of local Black physicians and Black activists who pledged to keep Flint Goodridge open and is a community-run hospital. Twice, Dillard backs out. And ultimately, they sell Flint Goodridge, not to this group, but to National Medical Enterprises Incorporated, which is a national health corporation that initially promises that they will keep the hospital open, but instead, they close it in 1985. The reason they buy Flint is because every hospital has what's called a bed license. And if you wanna have a hospital, you need to have a license to open up beds. You can take licenses from one hospital and transfer it to another and open up new beds in your hospital. So what they do is they buy up Flint, they close it down, they take those bed licenses, and then they take those licenses to other hospitals that they operate, historically white um, hospitals, uh, historically uh, white health institutions in the surrounding area. And Flint is shut down in 1985, right? Nearly all of Flint Goodridge patients end up in Charity Hospital, which continues to face state funding cuts throughout the 1980s and 1990s. By 2005, African Americans are 75% of Charity's patients. 85% of patients earn less than $20,000. Over half have no medical insurance. Other hospitals in the area average 4% of their patients with no medical insurance. Combined, all the other hospitals in the entire surrounding area treats 17% of all uncompensated cases in New Orleans. Charity treats 83%. In the 90s and early 2000s, funding cuts lead to the closure of 200 beds, all of the hospital's external clinics. The average wait time for emergency room services is 12 hours. Right? And as I was talking about with, with, with you before, the emergency room for many people is their only access to healthcare. Right? And it's a 12 hour wait. If you wanna get access to one of the clinics and this is non-emergency care, the average wait time is six months, right? All this is certainly gonna change with Katrina. In August, 2005, Katrina inundates New Orleans and much of the Gulf Coast. 80% of the city floods, including many of the city's hospitals. Charity Hospital temporarily closes due to flooding in its subunits. However, military units and the hospital staff at Charity return and have it ready to reopen just weeks after Katrina. But the administrators, um, LSU, which has been spending years 
trying to shut down the space and open up their new hospital, refused to open up. And instead they used this disaster as an opportunity to finally get their own new hospital. Over the objection of the hospital staff and many residents of the city, LSU spends years fighting the federal government. The federal government initially says, charity can reopen. You have some damage, but we'll give you some funding to repair the hospital, you are safe to reopen. LSU does not want to reopen the space because if they do so, they can't get money to open up a new hospital. So they, they keep it close. In late 2005, FEMA estimates that charity needs about $24 million in improvements, and they're going to give them $24 million to repair. That's not enough to build a new hospital. LSU, with the aid of local and state politicians, successfully lobbies FEMA for the next several years and ultimately get $475 million in federal FEMA funding. Um, you know, and, and this is one of the most controversial things that certainly takes place. Um, I've certainly there's a, a, a lot of stories that go around about the closing of charity. And one of the things that that the people who worked at the hospital have also talked about is how administrators kept it closed. And not only did they keep it closed, um, reportedly they got hired people to go into charity and to damage the hospital. So that way, when inspectors would come in to see it, they would say, oh, OK, this hospital is way worse than we initially thought. Um, that hospital closes and never reopens. LSU will succeed in getting money from FEMA and then hundreds of million dollars and other federal funding sources to build this, right? And I know this is an extremely blurry picture, but the new medical complex here, this is a new $1.2 billion university hospital, which is adjacent to a new billion dollar VA hospital. These hospital complexes open up in 2015 and 2016, respectively. So for 10 years, there really is no replacement for charity hospital operating. For a number of the years afterwards, um, you have West Jefferson and East Jefferson kind of taking over. They eventually do open up Hotel Du, the old university hospital, which opens as the basically the city's level one trauma center, but it is 89 beds instead of the hundreds of beds that operate at a charity. And then when they open up the University Medical Center in New Orleans, they shut down the old Hotel Du. This is a decade after charity was closed. To build the 1,500-acre medical district, the city and state will use their eminent domain power, again supported by federal funding, to raise 265 homes and dozens of businesses in the predominantly Black upper mid-city neighborhood. This is 80 years after they displaced Black residents to build the new charity hospital in the 1930s. This is four decades after they tried to expand this with the 1969 HEAL legislation and the 1971 funding through uh, urban renewal. Now in the 20 teens, they finally succeed and they build this. This new hospital, it's different. And one thing I'll note is they changed the name, right? It is no longer Charity Hospital, it's University Medical Center in New Orleans. Um, that is a purposeful rebranding. They decide that they want to drop the charity name because they don't want this association with this being a charity hospital. Even though this is really kind of a beloved name, they purposely want to do so because they want to rebrand. Instead, this is a new institution that is branded as a, as a what's called a destination hospital. They're predominantly trying to target patients to come in that need to do expensive medical procedures from throughout the region, the United States, or even internationally. They are only required to provide 20% uninsured individuals healthcare. So prior to this, this is a hospital that if you wanted to use charity, you had to meet income requirements, right? 100% of the patients had to be either low income or no income. Now it is 20%. So it is a complete reversal on their original message. Right? Um, just to kind of wrap up, all these turning points, the 1860s, the early 20th century, the 1960s, even this post-Katrina period represented opportunities for this healthcare system to really be improved to increase access for African-Americans to healthcare, to address health equity issues. But it doesn't happen. This happens because individual actors, doctors, hospital and medical school administrators, public health leaders, local and state officials, use their power to maintain historically white institutions and their ties to white supremacy. But this is also not just a story about, you know, individuals trying to do evil things. This is also a story about how really um, racism has become institutionalized into those systems. In the 1860s, you have leaders of the Battle of the Early Place were doctors. In the 1950s and 1960s, 
some of the leading segregationists are doctors. The person who founded the White Citizens Council here in New Orleans, the president of this organization, was um, a white physician here who was the head of the Orleans Parish Medical Society and the State Medical Society and a doctor and a professor at Tulane. Um, you know, he's a prominent person here, and this is not a problem. We don't have that kind of explicit racism that you see that you did in the 1950s, 1960s. Instead, it's become embedded into these institutions. These are institutions that for hundreds of years have exploited and excluded African-Americans. And now it's become kind of part of the history of these institutions. It's become part of the structure of these spaces. And we've had these moments in time when things could have changed and they haven't. One way you can certainly see this is in the continuation of high mortality rates. So this is the all-cause mortality rate for African-Americans compared to whites, 2008-2010 for Orleans, Paris, United States, and Louisiana. And you can see here, African-Americans have an all-cause mortality rate um, significantly higher than white residents in this, in this parish. And this happens throughout the United States, but it's even worse here in um, Orleans Parish. And it's not just a story about black mortality rate. And you can see here, here's the statistics I was talking about before, the black mortality rate versus the white mortality rate, which closes by 1970. By 2010, that gap has widened again. And historically, we like to think of American history as a story of progress. Things should have gotten better, right? And instead, that mortality gap has widened again in the past several decades, right? But it's not just a story about death, it's also a story about high rates of disease, right? Higher rates of heart disease, cancer, um, diabetes, certainly higher rates of homicide and, um, and, and death caused by HIV. Um, and you can certainly see this, you know, this is, I think, is one of the most striking contrasts of this, right? Um, you can compare the life expectancy for individuals um, based upon your zip code. Um, so there is a project created by the Robert Wood Johnson where you can put in your zip code and it'll tell you what is your life expectancy based upon the zip code in which you were born or in which you live. This is 70112 versus 70124, right? 70112, this is right around the central city part of New Orleans, right? 70124, we're talking about Lakeview. This is an area separated by a couple miles. Life expectancy for 70112 is 54.5 years, right? The life expectancy for 70124 is 80 years. That's a couple miles and 25 years in your life, right? One area is predominantly black and low income. One area is predominantly white and upper income. And it's a huge disparity. Um, these are reflections of what are called the social determinants of health. It's not just a story about inadequate access to healthcare. It is also a story about problems of access to good jobs where you get um, uh, health insurance. It's a story about the neighborhoods that you grow up in. Are you exposed to pollutants or to crime, right? That city planning, one thing that it did was it codified exposure to pollutants. So black neighborhoods, predominantly black neighborhoods starting in the 1930s, they were allowed to have commercial or industrial building in those spaces. White neighborhoods were not allowed to do so. So it's exposure, purposeful exposure to those pollutants. It is about lack of access to education. And some of these other conditions that mean that life expectancy is significantly lower for black residents than for white residents. Um, and um, I, you know, I think I'm going to end on that kind of sobering note. You know, I, I part of the reason why I've been I, I wrote this book and I, I'm trying to do these presentations is because I think we still have an opportunity in this particular moment to address these problems. I think that COVID has presented another opportunity where we can see health disparities. Um, and there was a moment, certainly 2020, 2021, there was a big discussion about the fact that African-Americans had significantly higher rates of death from COVID. And there was a conversation about social determinants of health and how we need to address these social determinants of health. And it's not just a story about individuals having poor, poor lifestyle decisions. It is a story about poor social determinants of health and a system of racism that particularly impacts African-Americans, their health. And I hope that moment is not lost when we can still kind of address this. So um, I will end with that, um, and I will uh, but to any questions that you all have. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that, this, this has been incredible. Um, I, I think it was all very sobering, and you have like taken us from the beginning to the end and shown us like the arc of it, and also like the turning points that we have missed as society. Uh, once again, y'all, thank you. Thank you to Kevin. Um, Kevin is a professor at Nickel State University, and uh, his specialty is in your background entirely in this. Um, 
I guess let's open up for question and answers at this juncture. Um, um, one question is, what was the name of the white doctor that was on the Orleans Medical? Uh, Emmett Lee Irwin was the, Emmett Lee Irwin was the name of it. Emmett Lee Irwin, yeah. Francis McGuffey asks, where can I find records about a person of color who was a medical doctor in New Orleans between 1892 and 1917? They are connected to Dr. Louis A. Martinet. I can help with this too. Okay, yeah, so um, here's one of the um, great things about New Orleans and one of the, the kind of the difficult things is a lot of these records are scattered. So certainly the city archives is going to be a really great resource. Um, you can also probably check um, Dillard. Dillard has records related to Flint Goodridge. So if they were associated with Flint Goodridge, there might be records there. Amistad also has a collection of some of these papers as well, including a number of prominent Black physicians. Um, and so you may be able to find some access there. So it just, it might be a little bit of hunting and gathering for that. Um, some of those, so these records have just be kind of become scattered, but I think those would be really great resources. And you might know some too, Amanda. Um, actually, yes, you have you have uh, hit a bunch of those beats. Obviously, like Flint Goodridge personnel records, we don't that that's not a, rec a record set that is accessible or exists. But um, everything that he mentioned as well, but then also general genealogy questions and genealogy research will possibly contribute. I missed something you said about 1970 um, Cook versus Oshner, mm -hmm. but I'd like for you to comment on why, even though we have been followed now, that it's still known that some particular hospitals only take a limited number of Medicaid patients, particularly behavioral health. Yeah, I mean, I, I, this isn't just a story about New Orleans. This is a story about healthcare institutions in the United States. But like I said, uh, it is technically uh, illegal to turn away Medicare and Medicaid patients or to send them to um, other institutions, especially public institutions. It's a, it's a practice known as dumping. Um, the, you can lose federal funding for this, but the enforcement of it is just, it's very rarely done. Um, and so hospitals continue to do so. Um, and part of it is because if you want, you have to prove it, right? You have to hire a lawyer and prove that you were discriminated against and prove that this was done intentionally. And so I think that's part of it is that there is an incentive for them to do so. And especially for Medicare and Medicaid patients, a lot of them are gonna be low income. So it's gonna be harder for them to hire a lawyer and then harder for them to prove it. So institutions will, will continue to do this. They will continue to send away those Medicare and Medicaid patients. You know, again, part of this is also a story about Here's a really great program that is very well intentioned, but has historically been underfunded. Um, and so un until that funding issue is really addressed, hospitals are gonna continue to do this. They don't want Medicare and Medicaid patients because they don't wanna take losses from this. Um, and it is really unfortunate because there are great programs that in theory should provide equity, that should provide access for low income or for elderly patients to use this. But then a lot of hospitals just don't want to treat them. So they continue to send them to other spaces. Here's our next online question. Um, slave owners required to sign waivers to give physicians approval to experiment on enslaved people. Uh, that's a great question. Um, so, um, not, uh, I mean, not really. There wasn't, there's no type of issue about things like consent, like consent forms is really, uh, even the idea of having medical consent is sadly not something that really kind of pops up really, especially in a formalized way until the mid to late 20th century. Now, usually if an enslaved person, if an, an, a doctor was going to do some type of experiment on an enslaved person, they would usually try to get some type of permission from the enslaver because they might be worried about facing some type of lawsuit, right? Especially for like property loss. Um, but a lot of the doc, I mean, that's, and that's how enslaved patients are being viewed as, right? They're being viewed as property. And so they would usually have to get some type of consent from the enslaver, but sometimes they wouldn't. Sometimes they would just, you know, really just operate however they wanted to. Sometimes also physicians themselves are, are buying, are purchasing enslaved people themselves to conduct experiments on um, because they're going to make money, right? If you, the way that you would do it is, you would operate. So for example, in the field of, of gynecology, many advances that are made, enslaved um, women will be experimented on by white physicians, including some of the physicians here. D. Warren Brickle is one of the leading 
physicians here, and he's a, a, a big name in the field of gynecology and obstetrics. He does a number of experiments on enslaved women here, several of which die. And then he perfects his technique on this particular medical procedure that he's doing on enslaved women. And then when he gets it done, and he, he knows that he's not going to be likely to be killing patients, he then starts to apply it to white patients, who will then he charge money for. And then he attracts a lot of wealth, gets a lot of medical prestige. He also publishes, I, I'd shown just briefly, the New Orleans um, a Medical Journal, this surgical and hospital journal. Um, these white physicians will publish all their accounts in these journals. And this is a leading medical journal. And they will get all these prestige. And then they'll attract more clients. And then they'll get more wealth. So in some cases, they will try to get um, the consent of the enslavers. Um, in some cases, they don't really need to do so. The enslaver will kind of allow them to do whatever they want to that enslaved person. Sorry, what did you say about his name again? Um, his name is D. Warren Brickle. Um, and he was a physician who operated here at Charity. And then there was also another school, the New Orleans School of Medicine. Um, and he operated, he had his own hospital as well. Um, and he's one of those names in the field of gynecology and obstetrics that is a little lesser known than like a J. Marion Sims, who um, for many years has been known as the, the, the father of gynecology. He was a, a physician operating in Alabama. D. Warren Brickle tried to do many of the procedures that Sims made famous, and he tried to do them here um, and to, to amass great wealth and prestige. I mean, he's experimenting on enslaved people. He's not as known as J. Marion Sims, who used to have a statue in City Park that recently got uh, in um, New York's City Park that got taken down. And he had statues in Alabama um, and he's been a very kind of controversial figure. D. Warren Brickle is kind of our version of that. Um, but there's other physicians here too that are doing the same type of thing. And, you know, pretty prominent physicians here, you know, I identify a number of them in my book, but some of the biggest names in the history of medicine here in this city have been associated with this. Matas at, at, at Tulane, um, is a physician who is very much advocating white supremacy and racist notions of African Americans. Um, uh, Bensadon, who there is a lecture series named after him at Toro. Um, he is one of the biggest uh, providers of healthcare for enslaved people. He operates um, out of Toro. Um, um, Alton Oshner. Um, Alton Oshner is probably, probably the most famous physician associated with the city. He creates a space, a hospital that is whites only. He, I talked about this in my book briefly. Um, he wrote an introduction for this white supremacist book that gets published in the 1980s that is openly advocating basically apartheid in the United States. And he thinks it's this great book and writes the introduction for it. So here's this individual who makes some really great advances in, in medicine, the history of cancer. is a really dark side of it. And it's somebody that, People feel very uncomfortable kind of you know criticizing but it's an important conversation to have um so after so much work um and research and um looking at the evidence the evidentiary sort of fossil record but what is your personal um sense or idea about how we move past this that cycle of progress, retrenchment, progress, retrenchment, retrenchment, which in my view dates back to the founding of the nation, right? Yeah, I mean, the big picture, right? The only way that you really move past that is you address structural and institutional racism writ large, right? I mean, that is really the only way you do it, you know? I mean, if you really wanted to do this, you'd have to dismantle that system. And you'd also have to create a medical system that is more equitable of, you know, a it's hard to also have it for a for-profit healthcare system in the United States that has very little government regulation. It's easy for these systems and these inequities to exist. So the reality is really, if you really want to address that, you'd have to, to address structural and institutional racism and address the, the major problems in medical institutions like that. I don't see that happening anytime soon. You know, it doesn't seem to be necessarily something that we can have. I think the basic things that, that we can do though is, Number one, have conversations like this. Number two, um, there are spaces, um, organizations that do trainings for hospitals and medical schools 
um, that talk about anti-racist policies. And I think that is, you know, a real basic thing that that schools and clinics and hospitals need to and should do at this moment is at least start to have that conversation because they need to have hard looks at themselves and say, what are not just these kind of outright racist policies, but how has it become kind of part of our structure and our system? And how do we eliminate this, right? There was a big incident recently that happened in, in last year before at Tulane at the medical school, for example, their first black medical director, right? Um, there was a big incident where she had been removed. Um, and there was um, um, there's an ongoing investigation into this. And a lot of medical students have come forward and said that they have faced racial discrimination as black medical students at that institution. Right? And here's this moment where that institution needs to then have a conversation and figure out what they can do to better support those black medical students and to address their own history. I think some institutions are doing that. They're having conversations about that. But I think that needs to happen. I mean, the other thing too that needs to happen is we need to address the social determinants of health. Um, access to healthcare is one part of it, but until you have better access to education and jobs and many of the other social determinants of health, it's kind of a losing battle just to focus on the healthcare aspect of it. So there, those are my kind of big picture ideas. Um, but I think at least hopefully something like this starts a conversation and people can then take a look at the history of their institutions and maybe start instituting anti-racist policies at that local level and then hopefully work up from there. Um, but it's hard because until structural racism is really addressed, many of the health inequities are just going to continue to be perpetuated. So let me let me do one of the online questions and then we will do you next. Um, is there data available regarding the quality of care of Black patients received at Flint Goodrich versus non-Black hospitals? So the data that exists, so Dillard does have pretty extensive records on Flint, which are fantastic records. Um, the data that does exist is primarily in the forms of things like um, the mortality rate at those hospitals. And one thing that you can see is that Flint has a significantly lower death rate than other white hospitals operating into that time period. Um, and that is data that definitely supports that. Despite the fact that they are underfunded and understaffed, the quality of care that patients are getting at Flint Goodridge is absolutely extraordinary. Um, and they, they have um, reports that are put out um, every single month. They would have um, board meetings and they would have these and they would collect all this data. So that data does exist. So if you're interested, there's an archive at Delaware University that has all the records or most of the records. Some of the records are at Amistad, some of the records are at UNO, but most of the records, some of the records are at the city archives, um, but most of the records are at Delaware University in their archives and they're a really rich collection there. Great archive. Yeah, so there are, there are some advocacy groups in the terms of, um, there are some groups that, that will do like licensing for medical schools. So there is an ongoing investigation. I, I believe the investigation is still ongoing into what happened at Tulane and trying to address those issues. There are certainly some advocacy groups and I, I can get you the name of it. I forget the name of it off the top of my head, but there is a group actually that, that operates here in New Orleans that does training on um, anti-racist policies in healthcare. And they will provide um, training for institutions, for medical schools, and for um, hospitals. But so much of it is so deinstitutionalized. I mean, the reality is we have a really hands off system here, but there's just not a lot of regulation. And so there are advocates, there are a lot of organizations, community organizations, but part of it is, is whether or not they can get access to this. One thing that you did see is that there are advocacy groups that got formed of medical students, former medical students at Tulane that have tried to push them to do things and to improve conditions there. And so that's been really great. Um, but again, there's only so many limited resources that they have and it's hard for them to change an entire institution. And there's very few kind of larger watchdog organizations that are then gonna kind of come in and, and punish anybody for doing anything wrong. Even the federal government, right? I mean, the, the federal government, institutions like that do receive federal funding. So if there are allegations of discrimination, they could potentially lose federal funding. But the reality is the federal government doesn't really do much of that. Um, there, there could, I mean, you could file complaints. Um, that, and I, the individual who was fired, she did file a, a, a complaint against that, a lawsuit against them. And that's an ongoing thing. And that is mostly what ends up happening is if there is some type of um, overt discrimination, you can file a lawsuit and that can go before the federal government. 
but again, it's it's hard to do. It's expensive. It's timely. It's 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 a difficult process, and so it's hard for those institutions to really change. Barbara Trevine noted the white physicians who paid dues to Flint Goodridge could do surgery in Flint. Um, she had her appendix removed at Flint in 1963 by Dr. Lawrence McCune. Oh wow. Okay. Yeah. I mean, like I said, yeah, they they had several hundred white physicians in the city who were visiting physicians that they would treat black patients, especially their upper income black patients at Ben Goodrich Hospital. Um, and that's the only reason that the institution can really survive is because there's just not enough black physicians to operate there. Uh, yeah, because of uh, because of the closure of Flint Medical School. Yeah. Um, and at that time, meaning the uh, 68 to 70 post-civil rights, um, did black Americans also have the opportunity to work as health workers and serve the um, They They did so those institutions slowly start to integrate and to start to hire um, black nurses and then um, black healthcare workers in the late 1960s early 1970s like i said one of the, the problems is and and um there's some really great collections that i went through at university of new orleans and amistad they have the naacp records which also have all the complaints that are made to the local chapter and the state chapter and i went through dozens and dozens of complaints of patients, but also of employees who would say, I'm being discriminated against. Um, uh, there was a, 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 a group that complained at one of the hospitals here in New Orleans that said that white doctors refused to call black nurses by their last names. They would only address them by their first name. And white nurses, they would call them by their last name. And it is purposefully done as a, as a sign of disrespect to them, that they would also have to um, punch out in the basement and the white nurses would be allowed to use the punch up card upstairs. And it is just, it is, is purposely done. So that is taking place even as they're integrating a lot of the black healthcare workers are still facing a lot of discrimination and a lot of them are sorted. This is one of the major problems in healthcare today. African-Americans are underrepresented as physicians. Um, African-Americans today, and I, I forget the most recent statistics, there's somewhere around 5% of all physicians in the United States, despite being about 15% 15, uh, 15 of the population, 14% of the population in the United States, about 5% of doctors. Um, they're hugely underrepresented in medical schools. Um, they are underrepresented in some of the higher wage, higher skill jobs in healthcare, overrepresented in low wage jobs. So this has historically also been a major problem is that African-Americans are usually racially sorted into these low wage jobs like techs, like um, um, home health nurses, predominantly fields of uh, people of color, and they are low wage jobs in the healthcare sector. So even though African-Americans have started to work in the healthcare field increasingly, and healthcare is the number one employer, um, the fastest growing health uh, sector of the employment industry, right? Including here in New Orleans, right? We are a city that has now really hedged its bets on healthcare and the expansion of healthcare. And we are, the, this is a fasting um, economy in, the, in New Orleans and in much of the United States. But it is also a system that has historically racially sorted African Americans. And so I also think that's something that also has to happen. You know, you'd asked about some solutions. Um, black patients also face discrimination because there's an underrepresentation of African Americans as doctors. This is one of the reasons why African Americans also distrust the medical system because there's an underrepresentation of people of color in the medical field. And historically, the system white doctors have historically excluded or experimented against African Americans. And so it's harder for them to trust that system. One way we could do this, get more black doctors. Um, things like uh, uh, what's going on right now with the expansion of black medical schools, right? Now we're living in this moment here, right? Is it uh, Xavier, I believe, right? Xavier just is opening up their own medical school, which is Great, I mean, it's remarkable. And Xavier has a really great pharmacy program and now they're opening up their own medical school. And historically they have, I believe had the highest rate of acceptance for students in the medical schools out of any college in the United States. And now they're opening up their med own medical school. This is a really great story because hopefully this will then start to fill in that gap. But you also have to have this at Tulane and LSU and these other schools where there's a huge underrepresentation. African-Americans are about a third of the population here and way underrepresented in the medical schools in Louisiana and the United States. So that's also something I think we can do is try to do better at that and expand access to African Americans to, to some of these higher wage and, and higher skilled jobs for healthcare. Even the history that you just let us know, 
what do you think the proposed OPMC humane measure will have an effect on the local health care, considering they want to shut down too many hospitals downtown? And what do you think is referencing? Yeah, I mean, this is a story that, you know, the United States health health court corporations really have increasingly taken over hospitals and other clinics. Um, it is a concentration into the hands of a small number of hospital uh, corporations. Here in this area, there's basically two games in town. It's Oshner and it's LCMC, and they operate in most of the hospitals here. Some of it can potentially be good, better sources of funding, but part of the problems also is with the monopolies. They can also charge higher rates. They can close down institutions that may not be making as much money, which may be serving a predominantly lower income or a people of color population. So we have certainly seen this when hospitals become, when areas become too concentrated in the hands of one or two hospital corporations. Historically, there has been an increase in prices and a decrease in terms of access for patients, especially lower income patients. So I know I've, I've certainly watched this and I've been very, you know, kind of wary of what's going on. Um, there was a lot of other hospital corporations that used to operate here, HCA, Tenant, and all of them have sold. Um, and they have an incentive to make money. I mean, they are for profit or sometimes not for profit or nonprofit, but a lot of cases, what they want to do is they want to make money. Um, and it's not necessarily about in, you know, increasing access or addressing health equity. For them, it is about making money. Um, and that is you know, kind of problematic for a healthcare system. A for-profit system is really problematic for increasing health equity. So yeah, I've, I've seen that. And it's, I'm you know, a little frightened about what's taking place with that. Um, let's see here. Uh, so we have a lot of good comments. Um, Anisha Shetty says this should be mandatory education for med students and physicians in this city. I agree. I think Tulane should make them all read the book. That would be that would be great. Uh, yeah, if they want to offer me a job, you know, that's that'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. Every med school in the city, no question. Um, Nisha Jackson noted this is crazy how the past is still the present towards the end of the presentation, and that is so true. Um, Sonia Morris said, great information and the data is very resourceful, wild and maddening. Um, and Francis McGuffey says, your book is so sobering. Thank you for highlighting this history. We have a lot of thank yous. Um, and I just want to see if there is, oh, um, Tanya Walker notes that several times when the gap could have and should have been closed in the, uh, in those by those in power, our city representatives allowed it to remain open. Um, so there's a lot of importance in advocating to your city government and your local politicians, your local like state representatives, not even like your federal representatives, although you should do that too, but you really need to pay attention at the local city government level and the local state government level. That is where you should direct letters, uh, your notice and advocacy. Uh, let's see here. And then um, Anisha Shetty. Okay, here is a question from Zoo. Curious about also viewing this for from the lens of forced labor and incarceration that continues today. The health impacts of for formerly and currently incarcerated people is huge. And the fact that some in the city are trying to spend 110 millions on a glass cage panopticon in mental health wing in a jail, Orleans Justice Center, rather than investing in community health and access is perpetuating this history. Um, yes, and then um, actually uh, somebody did ask online, what role does Xavier University of Louisiana play in closing the gap of black doctors in the profession, which you just answered for us. So in that case, that is one question from Zoom. Is there another question from the audience? <laughs> I do think it was just fascinating to see the start of this education. I think what I noticed in the first between the state and the black as far as the COVID, and I found it for the time, they announced the opening of two more research centers before the mayor disclosed they had hundred COVID cases. In the work, how many research facilities did we 
You know, I, I don't know that off the, um, off the top of my head. I, I, I probably have it written down somewhere. I mean, there are a lot of, New Orleans in a lot of ways has become a, um, not just a hospital hub, but a medical research hub. Um, and that's part of that. So the medical district of New Orleans, right? Um, that is kind of the, the legacy of HEAL and they're able to use HEAL. One thing that they wanna do is they wanna bring in research centers like that and bring in a lot of um, uh, healthcare related research facilities. And so you, you're seeing them pop up all over the city. I, I don't know how many re, re, medical research centers there are here, but there are certainly a, a lot of them and that's purposeful. This city has decided, and a lot of cities have decided this too. This isn't just sort of New Orleans, but cities all over the United States have decided. Research centers, medical research, biomedical research, that's the growing field. Let's get in on this at ground level. Let's add on new jobs to this. And it can be really problematic. Um, and it's a weird relationship too, because the city wants to bring in jobs, but they're also jobs that have been contributing to gentrification and displacement of the black residents. And then there are also jobs that are predominantly bringing in upper income white people from outside the city who are then also contributing to gentrification for this. And so it is a really problematic relationship. It can be really, I, I, I get why it's seen as for city leaders, there's this great economic opportunity, but they don't think about some of the negative consequences for that. So um, I can certainly look into that though and, and try and get back to you about that, about the number of med uh, research centers that we have here. Um, I'll note too, the, the, the person who had talked about um, uh, prisons and, and healthcare for the in, um, incarcerated population, Louisiana has the largest incarcerated population, not just in the United States, but really per capita in the world. I mean, we are the leaders from this. New Orleans has the highest rate of incarceration in Louisiana. Um, and Louisiana has the highest death rate of any prison system in the United States. Um, we have a really horrific healthcare system in, the, in, in, in prisons and in jails here. The Orleans Parish Jail has been a notorious site of, of really bad healthcare and of high rates of death. And there's been a lot of pretty public events that have happened there and a lot of attention that's been paid onto that. Angola. Right. Um, the um, women's prison, um, they also have really low levels of access to this. Um, we have a really bad system of health care, especially for the incarcerated. Um, and because we have this really high incarcerated population, um, it is a major issue and something, you know, it's something that I really like to do further research on because that is a population that is so underserved. Um, and it is one of the reasons why we have such a high death rate for the state. Um, and it is, I mean, it is appalling the conditions from that. And historically, unfortunately, that has been the case. Um, people in, in healthcare, in prisons and in jails have gotten really low levels of access to healthcare um, and something that definitely needs to be addressed. Uh, Robin Goldblum says, thank you so much, Dr. McQueenie. Um, she will share with the National Council of Jewish Women in New Orleans chapter. Oh, they are partnering with the Center for Multicultural Affairs in particular black Jewish relations. So they wanna share your work. That's um, fantastic. And then um, the library did recently do a screening of on this issue. It is promiseofjustice.org. This may be controversial, but I know that there are people, politicians who say this presentation is promoting a work I think you know what I mean. You know, people are like in, in terms of hospitals, you know, I've heard of even like hospitals uh, you know, and had diversity, inclusion, equity, equity training, and mm -hmm. some employees are even resistant to it now. I'm tired of being told that I'm racist, uh, you know, things like that. But uh, that being said, I just want just to raise that point. We just live in the time. This is the time we live in. Sure. I mean, I, I mean, I I certainly, rec you know, I mean, I knew that when I do these presentations, right, and when I wrote the book, I mean, this is a moment, yeah, when there certainly has been a strong backlash against stuff like this, right? Um, I, I, yeah, I mean, absolutely, right? Um, you know, uh, there are places where I, I can't give this talk. Um, there are institutions that um, if I tried to give it there, um, they would get in trouble or I would get in trouble, right? Or um, that would not hire me um, because of what I do. Um, and, um, you know, and that is unfortunate because oftentimes those are places that need this conversation the most. Um, but I think that's also why this conversation needs to take place, right, is because 
there are there is this pushback against this and people want to kind of clamp down onto this and that's what has allowed this conversation to continue and historically we've seen this right post civil rights era there's a strong conservative backlash right same thing post reconstruction conservative backlash for this and we are living in another one of these moments that um i i hope we can continue to have this conversation i don't know, and this the state might be the same way i don't know if i'll be able to give this talk in a year i don't know if i'll you know, have my job in a year, you know, depending upon the way that the elections could go, right? Um, and that is the reality that we live in. So this is why I'm I'm trying to have this conversation as much as I can and do as many of these presentations as I can now before you know I get fired or something else happens. But um, you know, it's it's a really it's a difficult time period. But you know, this is also something that I I, I can do. I also come from a position of of relative privilege too. I am a white high you know higher education you know professional that. One thing I can do is I can try to use my voice and my platform to advocate for those things. And sometimes also the people in power are going to listen to me more so than they're going to listen to somebody else, um, which is a sad reality. But this is a way that I can then use my voice to try to advocate and to try to start a conversation um, and to hopefully, you know, tr try to create that conversation where change can take place. But it's certainly a very contentious time period to do that. I want to note, uh, Anisha Shetty says uh, she would love to connect you with Tulane's formerly incarcerated Transitions Clinic. Oh, great. And okay. her organization, which is Voice of the Experience, which is is awesome. Um, I really uh, enjoyed working with a couple of y'all the other year on one of the uh, LEH uh, reading programs. Um, let's see here. Uh, so, so Anisha, his email is on the screen there. Be sure to email him. Yeah, please do. And um, then you were next. Yeah. Um, so you had said the the data that exists uh, suggests that Flint Goodrich had a lower mortality rate than any of the other hospitals in the city. Um, I was wondering if there was sufficient information available to speculate as to why were they more community focused rather than profit focused, higher doctor patient ratio, or, or like I think a lot of it is because they are so much more community focused. Um, they operate a, they start, first off, they, they start a series of clinics throughout the city um, that they operate clinics that are going to be addressing some of the chronic health conditions there. Um, I think part of it is it is an institution that is so invested and representative of that community. The leaders are from that community. Um, the, you know, some of the physicians, Rivers Frederick, the head of the surgery department, right? He is a resident of this community. Many of the doctors who operated there are from New Orleans or got training at Flint Medical School or, you know, who lived here, then got trained in Meharry or Howard and came back here. And so I think a big part of that is just, yeah, it is a story about a community institution that is really caring about its residents and is willing to do those things. Um, and fortunately, they had some good funding sources. For a number of years and then they kind of dried up but they are an institution that is really focused on that and because of that community mission i think they're able to achieve success where some of these other institutions were are focused on profit and expansion and prestige they don't have that as their mission so that would probably be my speculation yeah uh one one late late comer to the zoom um hello my name is LaShawn robinson new my husband and I are visiting from Connecticut. We both work in healthcare. We found it important to be part of this conversation. We see that health disparity is is huge in community of colors. Thank you for allowing us to tune in. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, do we, yeah, There's please. a question in the back. Where can I get it? Uh, the book? So um, if you want to get the book, um, it is available through UNC Press. Uh, we have two copies circulating in the collection, but I do know there's a lot of reserves on them right now. But if you want to get on the list for the libraries, um, you can get on the list for it. I think that they, a number of institutions are starting to get it. Part of it is also kind of piecemeal where it's like, it's kind of on me to then contact institutions and say, hey, why don't you get this book? Um, so um, that's partially part of it too. And if people want to request it through an institution the institution can then get it too um but i i hope um it seems like we've got to a point where i, I wanted to tack on to something that you there was the question about why was um the mortality rate um diminished in just three decades at like the rich and i just wanted to add to what you um said everything you said is exactly on point but it's not an anomaly mm -hmm. The history has shown that when Blacks have an opportunity to move something forward for the Black community, 
it's very highly successful. So therefore, Black institutional um, solutions to problems mm -hmm. tend to be much more successful and, and far-reaching. So, you know, you go back to something like Bacon's Rebellion, where people are, you know, enslaved Africans are opposing the governorship in the colonies, in the, in the founding colonies, which in the Virginia colony. And then you move up to some of the experimentations, which, by the way, um, the treatment of of black people, black women in the healthcare system, and the disposition towards their pain and suffering is not has not changed. Right? Oh, absolutely. There's lots of, of current um, articles being written about how doctors are seeing people when they look when they see black patients, they don't feel pain in the same way that other people feel. Yeah. These kinds of conclusions are being drawn out of research. But as you go through um, the, the the election of of political officials just after Emancipation Proclamation. So we have this ton, you know, we have Penny Baker, we have a black governor of, the, of Louisiana. And so it is very explicit and in, intentional that there is a response to that, to each one of those progresses, right? Each one, there is a crackdown. So we get the invention of the Ku Klux Klan during Reconstruction. We get, you know, a fascist authoritarian seeming government after the election of a black president, right? We these things are, are patterns. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel like we are drawn into sort of bureaucratic discussions about the details, which are very important. We need those details, we need that research. But I think it should serve a larger conversation that makes sense. And so, and so the energy is like is sort of dissipated by the time we get to solving the problems at their root. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I mean, those are, those are great points, you know, and I, I, one thing I, I, I like about doing this research is, you know, this is a story about New Orleans, but it's not just a story about New Orleans, right? The, that history about advancements by African-Americans and then backlash by whites is a story in the United States. You know, the story that takes place here where you have advancements, you know, you talk about issues of slavery, right? One of the really fascinating things and something I do talk about in the early chapters in the book is some of the big medical advances in the history of the United States are being introduced by African-Americans and enslaved people brought over from Africa. Cesarean birth, right, is a practice that's carried out by people in Africa and then are forced into slavery and is introduced here. Many of the medical advances are introduced by enslaved people that get forced into slavery here. Smallpox, right, the first inoculation, the first vaccine introduced by an enslaved person here, right? Enslaved by Cotton Mather in Massachusetts. So many of these advances are made. And then even when African-Americans can't formally become physicians, they're operating as doctors, as lay healers, as midwives throughout slavery and making great advances. And it's way better than mainstream medicine in the 18th, 19th century, which a lot of the treatments are going to kill you. Um, and a lot of the advancements that are being made by African-Americans are going to be significantly better. New Orleans is an, an example of that where you do have midwives and physicians and you have this pretty large black um, medical community here, but it is a story about self-help and this model of focusing on improving African-American lives and health and equity in the face of white supremacy. And it is, how do we improve lives for our own community despite all these obstacles? And when these changes do happen, you're absolutely right. We have advancements, and then we have a backlash against it. We have another advancement, and then there's a backlash against it. Right now, we're living in that moment again, where you have that advancement, and now we're facing a strong backlash against this. Um, and it's like a cycle that we just can't get out of. Um, and it's unfortunate, too, right? Because it shouldn't have to be a story about how the Black Panther Party has to operate their own clinic, because white physicians don't care about sickle cell anemia. Right? But that is the reality of that story. Um, and until we can break out of that cycle, that's what it's going to be. It's going to be kind of a continuation of this. Um, and so I don't know. I hope that you know stuff like this can kind of contribute to that larger conversation. But I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, it is a larger national meta story um, that is really difficult to overcome. So thank you for those comments. I really appreciate that. You know, doing these talks is also my way of kind of um, paying it forward also to the institutions that helped me. Like the library was such a great institution. And I was so grateful to be able to do this. 
I want to, I'm trying to line up a talk with Dillard because I did, I started off my research at Dillard and that's such an important institution and I want to be able to support them. So I'm going to try and do some talks, some other talks. I'm going to do a talk at UNO for the Midlow Center. Um, I did my master's at UNO and it's an institution that is really, you know, dear to my heart. So I'm going to do a talk for them in October. So I've got a couple other talks lined up um, with them too. So I will try to put out the word into the universe that I'll be doing some more talks. So if you wanted to find out where you were speaking, how would you find that out? Um, I guess the best way would be either to um, email me. Okay. Well, um, thank you again. Thanks, Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it.